All right. Well, welcome to part two of the totally non-copyrighted Busters of Myths special, as we have here. Um, we're going to be going through the, uh, the, the we're going to be busting some of the myths of identity management. Um, and so, as Joe kind of touched on earlier, um, first of all, for the, who, who was here in the last, who wasn't here in the last session? So very few people, that's awesome. Um, so just real quick, um, kind of talk about who we are. So we're One Identity. Um, you might never have heard of us, but you probably have. Um, if you know Quest Software, we were Quest Software for a long time, you know, well known as, uh, made a lot of software in the security space and the Active Directory space and the uh, database space and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, we got acquired by Dell several years ago and then uh, Dell went on a buying spree. What's that? Yeah, and then you know Michael Michael uh, Michael decided he wanted something newer and shinier, and so we we all got spun out, and uh, we're back to being uh, Quest Software, and we are one identity at Quest Software business. Um, so we're new, but we're not so new, and, and we've been here for a while. So when Joe and I were kind of brainstorming and, and trying to think about it, what we wanted to do for these sessions, um, we came up with this idea of MythBusters. And originally, I had a I had a black beret and a mustache I was going to wear, and we thought that was perhaps a bridge too far. So decided to kind of bring it back a bit. But what we really wanted to do was highlight some of the things that we've encountered in talking to customers, kind of some of the misconceptions, the myths, the, the concerns that are out there, and kind of talk about it in terms of, of ways that we can approach it. So I have a bunch that we're going to go through, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll all get something out of it. So let's take the first myth that I think we want to talk about. And it's, it's this myth of identity in the cloud. And the myth is, that you got your choice. It can either be you can either be on prem or you can be in the cloud, and there's 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 really no organization between the two. Um, and so, uh, let's talk about that and decide whether or not you know that's a real thing or that's something we want to we, we want to be concerned about. So I'm going to begin by telling you a story. Um, and normally, when I set up these stories, you know, I, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about you know, can I talk about this customer? Can I use their name? Do I talk about them? You know, Joe talks about a Mickey Mouse company he used to work for. Um, you know, so I, usually I'm not I'm not able to tell uh, to tell the name of the customer that we're dealing with, um, but in this particular case I can. Um, so Ed, this is the, we're going to tell you a story about uh, a customer that we work with, small food manufacturer based in Europe. You might have heard of them. Um, they uh, and the reason I can talk about them is because they were just announced as the winner of the prestigious Best IAG Project Award at the European Identity and Cloud Conference. So this was a cool thing. They. Uh, they, they, they chose uh, one identity as their identity and access governance vendor. Um, the project went very, very well. Um, I had nothing to do with it, but I have good colleagues in Europe who did. Um, and they, they, you know, they, did a, they did a fantastic job of kind of putting some of these things through. So the story is about Nestle. And uh, oh, I screwed my thing. Um, so you, you know, we sat down with them, and one of the things they said is, as they were coming through, they said, you know, we've got all these cloud applications, and we really want access to these cloud applications, and uh, we can we want to be able to use them as part of the identity and access governance solution. And we said, no problem. We can totally help you with that. Um, you know, our platform is really, really flexible. It's really, really powerful. You know, how many uh, identity governance applications, or how many uh, cloud applications would you say you want to onboard? And they said, 2,000. And so, you know, we said, 2,000. <laughs> Like that's that's kind of a lot. Um, okay, so you know, being the engineer in me, I, I enjoy math. So I sat back and I thought about some math, and I said, okay, so if we take two thousand applications, you know, that's a lot. Um, and our platform's the best in the world, so I'm sure we can do an app a day, right? That's not a problem. So we'll just divide that by the number of days in a year, and that's not good. That's not good at all. Oh, my sound effect didn't play. I had my Homer going. I don't like the sound of that. But uh, yeah, so so you know th that's that's not a good thing, right? We're talking about a, a long, long way for it to be able to do this, and so it kind of became very quickly. A few things kind of quickly became apparent. One was that we had to really kind of reset Nestle's expectations and figure out how we were going to be able to address them. But then you know if you if you unpack that a little bit, you say, well, wait a second, they're not that unlike you know lots of other corporations that are out there. You know, lots and lots of people are adopting you know cloud. That's kind of kind of a no-brainer, that's what everybody's talking about. Um, and moreover, you know, that, that pace is not decelerating, it's accelerating. You know, we're moving quicker and quicker and, and more and more cloud-based applications are, are occurring out there. And more than that, the acquisition pattern has changed, right? So, so you know, kind of in my historical career, you know, I've got more, more well, actually, I guess, less gray hair than I would, I would care for. 
um, more gray hair in the beard. But you know, when, when I started kind of in this industry, you know, 20 some odd years ago, uh, the, you know, the, the, the typical acquisition pattern was, you know, IT went and we decided what we were going to do and we picked a platform and then we slowly rolled it out to the business and there you go. Um, that's changing uh, a lot and I don't have to tell you guys that, but, but I want to highlight kind of a couple of the, the attributes. One is that we're seeing fewer and fewer centralized applications. So while there are a certain number of, you know, kind of enterprise-wide applications, what we're seeing um, a lot more of is kind of applications almost coming up at, the, at down to the work group level, where you may get you know five or six people who need to share some kind of application. They're doing their own kind of analysis. They're swiping a card, you know, bringing the application on board. Uh, now they're saying, "Hey, IT, how do you how do you help me support that?" Well, we're not going to write a connector for five users in a in a work group. But at the same time, the data and, and the, the environment they're going to be using has security implications. And so we need to be able to track and govern it, and we need to be able to, to deal with it. Um, the other thing that we're, we're seeing, and I, I kind of want to kind of want to highlight it here, is that the, 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 the kinds of applications that we're bringing in are spanning the gamut. Um, and so you know, we're seeing kind of everything from, from enterprise-wide applications in the, in the SaaS side, you know, uh, enterprise-wide HR applications, again, back down to kind of the departmental kind of level. And the reality is this is not going to go away. You know, so kind of the initial sort of knee-jerk reaction of the old school IT guy in me is, how do we clamp down on that and how do we stop that? Um, that's not going to be a choice. And I'll, I'll talk about this, touch on this a little bit more when I get to some of my, my, later, uh, my later bits, my later myths. But uh, the, the, the days of IT being able to, to clamp down on something and saying, we're not going to do that anymore, they're just gone. Um, the pressures on the business are too great in order to be able to support that. Uh, businesses are, are, are going to go around IT organizations and security organizations that impede them, not because they want to, but because they have to. Because the, the pace of innovation and the pace of, of, of uh, of change uh, has to be met, and if if security gets in the way, then we're going to go around security. You know, Joe tells a great story, some stories of some Mickey Mouse company that he worked for, where you know security policies come down and they say, no, you can't do that. You can't log into social media. But I'm the social media director. That's like my job. That's like that's the only thing I do here. Um, those days are long, long gone. And so hybrid is going to be the new enterprise IT reality, and responsiveness to the business is going to be the new uh, security reality. I'll talk about that kind of more uh, going forward. So if I put on my, my IAG hat and I think about, you know, how are we going to handle cloud, you know, the question becomes kind of what are my options? You know, what do I do? Do I do nothing and do I just ignore this SaaS footprint? Um, no, that's not really a choice. Uh, we have to be able to govern these things. Um, now, I will say, I'll kind of pause here and I'll say, I think that, that the level of governance and the level of management is not going to be one size fits all. Um, we're going to have you know, some SaaS platforms that are going to come in, and we may have very, very little touch on them. You know, maybe we're just going to take a look at a couple of, of uh, entitlements. Maybe there are going to be some that are going to fly under the radar, because they're not, uh, they're not material. They're not things that we need to be concerned about. Um, but, but broadly, as a strategy, ignoring SaaS is not going to be an option. We could do it manually. This is kind of sort of the old school. Well, we'll, we'll go through and we'll do it manually. I met with a customer um, actually just last week uh, in this very city, and uh, we sat down with them and we were talking about looking at, at identity and access governance and what they could do to do things. And, and uh, they said, oh, you know, we're not really looking to move our platform. Our platform does everything we need it to do. And I say, okay, well, what about this? Oh, well, that's a manual process. Okay, well, what about this? Well, that's a manual process. Well, what about this? Well, that's a manual process. Well, what about the stuff that you're going to be doing over the next, you know, 18 to 24 months? Oh, we're not going to be changing any systems over the next 18 to 24 months. I said, uh-huh. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not really an option. Um, it's maybe an option in the short term, but in the longer term, this isn't going to be possible, simply because the scale of these things is just going to simply outpace us. It's only a matter of time before your organization come, takes a look and says, you know, we have 2,000 SaaS-based applications that we're going to look at. Um, the company that Joe mentioned in, in, uh, in uh, the Valley, same story. You know, again, customer super proud that you know, we have nothing on-prem. Everything's in the cloud. And we say, OK, you know, what's the problem? He says, it's terrible. 
um, because it's so decentralized, they can't manage anything, they can't govern anything, they can't, um, they have no idea of kind of what's going on out there. Um, so manually isn't gonna be a choice, at least for the long term. Third choice, we can export import from SAS. This is, this is better than doing it manually, but not that much better. Um, we see this pattern a lot with uh, big systems there where we're pulling a ton of data from. You know, typically, if you're looking at the cloud-based HR systems, this seems to be a, a pretty common pattern that we're seeing where we're not gonna build direct connectivity into it. Um, we're just gonna take a dump and we're gonna use it kind of on a regular basis. I think that works for kind of the big systems where it's gonna be enterprise-wide. It's really hard to manage when we're talking about large numbers of small, um, small systems. So long-term, that's probably not going to, uh, not gonna be very viable either. Build a custom connector for each SaaS target. This is the old standby for all of us in the identity management system, in the identity management game. You, know, you have a system, I need to connect to it, I can write you a custom connector. Um, unfortunately, even if you have the best identity management platform in the world, which we do, and you can build a platform, a, a connector once a day, uh, it's still, you know, again, we're talking about years and years and years. So the platform is not gonna, is not gonna be able to, be able to scale that. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that we're gonna do here. How do you enable a self-service? You know, how do we dump information? The, the big one on this thing is how long is it gonna take to do all this kind of stuff? And so we took a look at all this platform, you know, informed by what we, what we heard from our customers, looked at all these problems, and we said, what we really need to do is we're gonna need to build a hybrid architecture. So we have existing on-prem stuff, and we know how to deal with on-prem uh, entitlements pretty well. We've got this new cloud environment, and we talked about the attributes that are coming down from this cloud environment. Um, we know that we can't apply an on-prem paradigm to that, um, because users are gonna want to be able to consume cloud-based solutions like a cloud-based solution, meaning it should literally be swipe a credit card, turn a key, I'm up and running. And applying any of the paradigms we've already talked about aren't gonna be valid kind of in that model. And so we took a look at it um, and we said, what do we need to do? We need to build a hybrid-based model that we can manage in terms of a, in terms of a, uh, that manage the way we do a managed service. Um, so I wanted to talk to through kind of a, 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 again, as a prototype architecture, this is kind of the way we do things. Um, on the left-hand side here, you see we have kind of your traditional on-prem connector of things. Um, typical identity and access governance system, right? Draw that as like a cloud. On the right-hand side of the, the screen is, is this, what I would call part of kind of this, ha this hybrid cloud or kind of our hybrid target. It's a managed system, a managed service that lives up in the cloud, um, communicates with the on-prem system in term, over, a, over a common framework, SCIM, which everybody should probably know about if you don't know. It's the System for Connected Identity Management. Did I get that right? I could have, my, my acronym may be off. It doesn't really matter. Skim. Yeah, it's Skim. It's Skimmy. Uh, but, you know, again, a, 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 a uh, you know, open standards kind of thing. Um, from that side, then we can connect out into basically any um, any cloud target. And so the idea of the way we're going to address this is uh, the managed service is going to handle the connectivity to each of the downstream um, connections. So we're shipping. We have on the order of you know 25 we've done so far. We're adding more every week. You see a bunch there. You know we can can go check on oneidentity.com for the current list. But this is going to be kind of our strategy going forward for how we're going to scale. Uh, we're going to scale this stuff out. Um, and the idea here, the nice thing about this is as a consumer uh, of a platform, and by the way, I mean, we don't market it this way, but there's no reason necessarily that, the, that, that it would have to be the idea, that it would have to be one identity manager. Really any identity management target could consume this, assuming they could support a, a skim-based connector. Um, the idea is, is, that we, is that we, as a managed service, we can hide all the complexity of connecting to each of these downstream systems. Um, and as we manage and build these connectors, everybody can kind of take advantage of it. Um, so this is an example of a hybrid kind of architecture that, that we're shipping now. Um, and we really kind of feel like this is going to have to be the future of the, of the way we address these things for all the reasons we've already talked about. Um, so I'm gonna suggest that this myth is busted. It is non-prem, it isn't in the cloud. We have a little bit of both and. Cool. All right, myth number two. Um, I wanna talk about working with the business. And I'm not sure this is so much the, a, a, a myth. Um, but it's something that I think we, I want to highlight uh, for all of us as identity professionals that we have to kind of think about kind of going forward. Um, so, you know, we'll read my kind of blurb there. You know, one of the most often certified, uh, cited pieces of security wisdom is 
work with the business, right? But everybody knows that the, everybody knows the business doesn't care about security. Um, and I, I will say that's true. The business, by and large, does not care about security. So how do we know that we're working with the business, and how do we know that we're, we're, uh, we're properly aligned? Um, so I'm going to throw some thoughts out here. The first is, um, so this is a very complicated graph. I am not a PowerPoint jockey. Um, I have a colleague who is, uh, who can do you know, fab tabulous uh, things inside of Photoshop and, 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 uh, and uh, PowerPoint. I'm not that guy. So this is a very simple, di a very simple diagram that I use. Um, and, I, and so bear with me a little bit. But it's a pretty simple concept. And uh, it's actually one that I stole from Dr. Milton Friedman. Um, the, the Nobel Prize winning economist. And he said, among many of the smart things that he said, one of the smart things he said was, he said, you know, when you think about um, kind of cost and benefit, um, there's kind of four ways that you can spend your, you can spend resources, whether it's time or money or, or any of those kinds of things. You can spend um, those resources, uh, you can spend your own resources on something for yourself, right? So that would be in that, that kind of lower left bar there. And when you're spending something, your own resources on something for yourself, you're really focused on quality. You want to make sure that you get something worthwhile and, and, and good to have. Um, and you're really focused on cost. You want to minimize the resources that you're going to expend in order to, to get this benefit. You can spend your own resources on something for someone else, right? So that's that kind of upper bucket. Um, in that case, you're, uh, you're or sorry, you're spending, uh, you're spending your own resources on, uh, on something for someone else. In that case, you don't care very much about uh, quality. I have this backwards for some reason. You don't care very much about quality, uh, but you, you care a lot about cost. You're really trying to minimize you know, what you spend. You can spend, um, you can spend somebody else's resources on something for yourself, and in that case, you're going to have a very nice steak dinner. That's kind of the rule of thumb there. Uh, and then you can spend somebody else's resources on something for somebody else, and in that case, you don't care very much about cost, and you don't care very much about quality. I would submit to you guys, I would argue that most of the conversations that we have with the business around security, they think they're in that upper, that upper right-hand quadrant. They are convinced that, they are, that, that you are worried about something for, you, you, that they're spending your resources on something that doesn't matter to them. And so it's not really surprising that we get very low quality results from kind of those kinds of, those kinds of uh, conversations. What we really want to do, or, or when we think about alignment, we want to make sure that the business understands that, that we're really focusing on something for, ideally, we want them to understand that we're, that we're focused, that they're, they're going to get something out of this. And then at worst case, they don't care, you know, they, they want high quality but don't care about the cost. Or better yet, you know, we can really highlight the fact that it's going to, that we can highlight that there's going to be resources that they're going to need to, uh, need to be focused on. Um, and so, I would argue that kind of all of the conversations or all the things that we work with, it's really about getting the business to understand that they're, they're invested. And this is kind of a framework that does that. Now, there's lots of ways that we've tried to do this. Um, you know, regulation is a perfect example of that's, that's an external locus. That's a, uh, that's a government entity trying to convince the business that this is something that they should really pay attention to. Um, it's a terrible way to convince people to do things, right? So, and the reason I say that is, is, is multifold. One, um, I think it tends to produce outcomes that prove that you are complying with a regulation. And I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more. So you don't necessarily do a business process that's going to in any way to add value. You spend more time proving that you're compliant with the thing that you have to do. Um, it's, it's less about value creation, and more about uh, penalty avoidance. Um, Audits and policies and all these kinds of things are, are, are ways that we can focus the business. These are all sticks. Um, and they're a terrible way to focus the business because, uh, again, at best we're going to get kind of unwilling compliance or, or, or people being dragged, kicking, kicking and screaming. Much better way to focus the business is, is through the use of carrots. So if we can, if we can focus on things um, that are going to improve the user experience, that are going to improve, improve time to productivity, that are going to improve business opportunity, um, these are all ways that we can get the, that we can focus the business on, on what it is we want them to do. Sadly, um, the majority of the conversations that I have with security people rarely focus on the business to this, to this degree. I don't ever get, you know, queries from customers or RFPs from customers saying, you know, how are you going to enable a positive end user experience for me? I get RFPs that ask questions like, can you consume a 32-bit UTF-8 uh, flat file on a SQL Server 2012 version R2? 
the business doesn't care a rat's behind about any of that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, that's a very transactional kind of, uh, kind of thing to be concerned about. We spend an awful lot of time focused down in the, focused down in the weeds and the technical um, side of things. And I think there's a couple of reasons behind that. One, I think, is because it's an area that we as technologists are comfortable in. Um, and so it's, you know, we, we might ask a question that we don't necessarily know the answer to on the, on the business side of the house. You know, how are you going to enable a, a more positive customer experience? Um, it, it's a kind of a squishy, you know, kind of answer. As technical people, we tend to be comfortable with, with technical details. Um, but I think the other side of things is we don't necessarily know how to do any of those things. We don't necessarily know how, how to enable the business. And, and you know, we don't speak the same language. It's an uncomfortable kind of thing. And so we sort of focus on the thing that we, uh, that we focus on, the thing that we, we know we can, we can do well. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make here, and now it's gone. I don't know. Maybe it'll come up, come up again. Um, so the question was, again, kind of how, how do we focus on the business? Um, or how do, we, how do we enable the business is probably a better way of saying this. Well, if we're going to provide um, oop, wrong one. If we're going to provide uh, business uh, information to the business, we're going to ask them to do things. I think these are the three things that we need to focus on. They, we, the things that we need them, or, the, or the, their interactions, need to be simple. They need to be contextual, and they need to be differentiated. And I'll, I'll give you a case study to kind of talk about an example of, of, of what I do here. So, I mentioned I was here with a customer um, not too long ago, actually just last week. And, uh, oh, I know what it was. Do I, uh, is anybody in here from Centrify? No? Okay. Centrify I, I did a really good, um, just put out a really good uh, white paper talking about uh, security professionals and their perception of brand risk. And so they basically asked the question to a bunch of security professionals, you know, are you responsible for the, uh, for, for the health of your brand? How many of them what percentage do you think said, yeah, I, I, I'm in that loop. I'm part of that responsibility. If there's a breach and it damages the brand, it's, it's part of it's on me. You think it was a lot? Yeah, it was on the order of, it was on the order of about 15%. Um, Wrong-headed, guys. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's on us as professionals in order to, in order to do that. Um, so the things to think about. So a case study from a customer that, that I work with, uh, Again, um, we asked them around, it was all around access certification and how do we do it, and they begin by swearing up and down, there's no problem with it, you know, they've got it nailed, they're compliant with their audit requirements, they're ready to go. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about how you do it. And they said, well, we have a bunch of people and they take screenshots of the access that the person has, and then they email that to the, uh, to, to the, to the manager, and the manager asks whether or not that looks right, and then if it doesn't look right, then we email it back to them and we tell them, you know, you should fix it. And then we go back and forth. And, and then eventually we all just kind of give up and everybody approves everything. And we go from there, right? Nothing contextual and we go from there. So this is a perfect example of a horrible process. Um, it's exactly what I've been talking about. It, it's really, really painful, right? There's no contextual information. It's difficult to track. And most importantly, there's no real value add here. These guys are probably doing very, very little to, to proof the business, to, to, to improve the quality of their end user experience. Um, very, very little to, to add any actual value. Um, but they're compliant with the process. They kept saying over and over again, it's what our auditors told us to do. You know, we're compliant with what the audit is going to do. Um, and I, I would just argue that's just not good enough. So I want to give you a, maybe a different example. And again, this is, this is kind of from, from our identity and access governance platform. Um, I'm not here to sell you on identity on our IAG platform. Uh, but I wanted to give you an example of kind of some of the things that I think you should look for. These are examples of heat maps that we have within our solution. And I, I tried to kind of zoom it in, but it's probably still a bit of an eye chart. You know, so from the top here, if, if you look at the first one, we've got compliance rule violations by department, compliance rule violations by role, compliance rule violations by, you know, compliance rule violate, compliance rule violations by rule. Okay, so which rules are being violated? Um, see the pretty colors? A business guy can get his head around that, right? I know there's red. Red's bad, so I can go focus on what's red. If I give him a stack of paper that says go through here, it does, it's, it's utterly meaningless. And so the purpose here is not to tell you how great you know, our platform is, but it's to, these are the kinds of things that we have to be able to collaborate and think about how we want our businesses to, to work with. Um, 
back when I was back when I had a full head of hair, um, you know, my knee, knee jerk reaction to these kinds of things when we would give the business technology and they weren't able to adopt it, we'd say, we, I'd say, well, they're stupid. You know, they don't. They're not stupid. Um, they're just focused on other things. And so, if you want to get their attention and you want to go through it, you have to make it very, very simple. You know, again, if you're going to put a business rule in place, you want to be able to tell them which is the most important business rule, and it should be clear and obvious and ready to go. You know, we need to be able to hide complexity. Right? So on the lower corner, we've got some resource that the business needs access to called ADXYG123 group underscore local. They don't know what that is. They want to know payroll editor with a nice key, you know, easy to know description there. Um, so I would argue this is plausible. Um, it's possible that we can work with these guys in a meaningful way, in a rich way, um, but it's going to require work on our part um, as, as professionals in order to do that. Okay. So I did some, some technical. I did some squishy. Um, we're going to go into sort of a more technical, uh, a more technical piece of things here. Um, if I use the term red forest, how many people know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Awesome, because I'm going to explain it. So we'll be in good shape. OK, so pass the hash is a security attack that's moved from a theoretical problem to a mainstream concern. Um, any folks from Microsoft here, colleagues? OK, didn't know. I spent 10 years there, so I love those guys. But, um, so Microsoft proposes an architecture to mitigate the concern. Is this the only way to address the problem? So we should begin with kind of what's past the hash. So if, has anybody heard of the term past the hash? Throw that there. OK, I got one, one gentleman. It is a Cheech and Chong movie. That's not past the hash. That's past hash. Similar idea, concept. Um, OK, so I'll explain kind of really quickly. Um, and this is not to, not to dump on Windows. I love me some Windows. Um, but there's some, some nuances in the way kind of some of their architecture um, their architecture is done. And you know, I, when I worked for Microsoft, we used to describe it as, you know, when we would look at feature changes, we'd say we would describe it as like ordering pizza for 300 million. You know, so for 300 million people. Anyway, we've got some legacy we've got to work on. Um, there's some vulnerabilities inside the Windows architecture, right? So in the bottom, we've got our, our bad boy hacker. Uh, it's a black hat, as you can tell. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the common kind of attack methodologies here is uh, we allow users to attack workstations. Um, so if a user can get physical access to a, or can, can get access to a machine, um, and there's lots of ways we can do that, right, to get end user credentials. We can fish, we can do viruses, we can do port scans, we can do all kinds of things. But the bottom line is, if a hacker is able to infect a Windows machine, um, and they can get a machine that has been running a local administ where the user is running as a local administrator. How many people have users in their environment who run as local administrators? You're all liars. Every one of you is lying. That's fine. Um, yeah, so, so if, the, if, the, if the end user running is local administrator, um, they have a lot of privileges on the box. They can do whatever they want. Um, one of the problems that I concur with that is, and, and again, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over some of the technical details because, and not everything I'm going to be saying is 100% is specifically technically accurate because I want to make a broader point. Um, but if you want to say, that's not even how it works, dude, we could talk about that later. It'll be fine. Um, but one of the things you can do in there is you can, you can stop processes and you can do things like dump credentials that are on that account. So effectively, if you're a local administrator on that account, whether a legitimate or a compromised one, um, I can harvest whatever credentials you have, on, you have on that machine. So what that means is if you've had a domain administrator or a local administrator or a server administrator or whomever log into that machine, generally speaking, at any time in the future, because a lot of these, uh, in the past, because a lot of these things get cached, um, I can use those credentials. And I can use those credentials to then attack servers. And ultimately, ideally, if I can get to a server where a domain administrator is logged in, um, I can then escalate up and I can get to your domain controller and then you are pwned. So uh, that's the problem. And, and really, at the core of the problem, there's a couple things. It's um, users having administrative access on their on their their workstations and i would i would argue they're not going to be able to get away they're not going to get away from that for a long time because it's they i just don't see that as being realistic um, but the two bad things are domain administrators logging into lower privileged servers and administrators logging into local privileged servers and so uh, Microsoft has, has proposed an architecture. And they've said, well, what you really need to do is take your domain and you need to break it apart into three domains. And so you're going to have a tier two domain, which is just going to be your users and your workstations. And administrators for tier two can only log into tier two. And uh, in, in tier one, you're going to have servers. 
and server administrators. And by the way, these are not my slides. I should, I should have said this at the very beginning. Um, these are from TechNet. These are from, or from TechEd uh, two years ago. So, um, so I, I stole these from Microsoft um, because I don't want to, but, but I want to make, make it clear that I, I don't think I'm, dis, I'm misrepresenting anything that they would, that they would tell you as well. Uh, and then at the tier zero, um, you have only your domain controllers and your forest admins, and you only allow domain admins to tier in to that particular piece. So the idea is, at any given point, you can, you can authenticate up, but you should never be able to authenticate down. And so we kind of keep our, our domain credentials uh, pure and, 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 and are, don't ever allow it to go down. So the idea being that even if we are able to, uh, even if we get credentials stolen at a particular tier, you can't jump tiers. That's the concept behind it. And then again, um, I'll kind of go through it here. They've, they've built out this whole infrastructure called the Enhanced Security Admin Environment, but is much, much more known, much known much more commonly as a Red Forest design. Um, and I, I'll highlight kind of the two pieces that are, that are important here. Um, it's that tiered access approach where we have a, a logical separation between the domains. And then secondly, and much more importantly, a hardened bastion host administrative environment where administrators have a second, effectively, PC that sits on their desk that they only use to do administration and then they only use it to do in a particular tier. So this is the ESAI. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's totally worth going and reading the, uh, the white papers. They're available up on uh, Microsoft.com. It describes in, in granular detail kind of how this is going to work out and how they want it to, want it to kind of be architected. Um, and I, I'm encountering a lot of customers who are coming in. They're saying, well, we're doing this, this Red Forest thing. Um, you know, how do you think you guys can help us? And, and I, wanted to kind of, I wanted to kind of highlight a couple things um, as we go through here. This is a valid, completely valid architecture. Um, it, it addresses the problem that it's, it's trying to go through. Um, it's a secure infrastructure. It's got, you know, a very good firewall kind of between the tiers. Um, but there are some big disadvantages to it. Um, it's really complicated. You know, you're taking what was one domain and breaking it into three domains. Now multiply that by the number of domains you have in your environment. You guys are all running one domain, right, in your environments? So, so it's complicated. Um, it's expensive. It's, you know, it's expensive in a services perspective. Um, it's expensive not so much in terms of the DCs, but, you know, testing all the applications and making sure they work and remediating them and blah, 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 blah. Um, it's complicated. And, and finally, I would argue it's brittle. Um, you know, if you, if you make one mistake in one place and it, you're in a world of hurt, and it relies on administrators not ever making a mistake, which I would argue is a valid assumption in the enterprise that administrators never make mistakes, but um, it could go through. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I know. Well, it is Wednesday, and I haven't made a mistake yet this week, but, you know. So it's, it's really, really brittle, and it, it doesn't really necessarily solve the problem. So working with my colleagues, um, we came up with this idea of a virtual um, red forest, right? And I, and I, I have kind of couple, a couple of tiers that we could take a look at here. One is kind of the good, and I'll talk about the concept of an Active Directory administrative proxy. You can have better, and you can add password vaulting to that. Joe talked about that a little bit, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. And then if you really want to go for the super deluxe Cadillac version, um, you can adopt something I'll call active administrative control. Okay. So at the basic level, kind of the most important basic thing is AD administrative proxy with active roles. So active roles, and it doesn't have to be active roles. That's the, that's the, this is what we, what we ship with. Um, but you can do this with other technologies as well. It's a, it's a logical architecture, not necessarily a, a, a physical architecture from that perspective. Um, this is kind of a really high-level diagram of what, what this situation would look like. Complicated. I can go into the details if you want, but, but the 30-second the, you know, version is um, you bring a segregation, a logical segregation, a, a, an administrative proxy, if you will, between your Active Directory environment and your administrators. Because keep in mind, you have a whole tier of administrators. We're not just talking domain admins, you know, the guys with the god privileges who sit in the, you know, whatever. You've got help desk people who are resetting passwords, probably. You've got, you know, folks who are delegating administration. You've got this whole kind of gamut um, from, you know, low-level low people resetting passwords all the way up to super uh, propeller head domain admins. Um, by the way, in a Red Forest, all those people need to be in Bastion hosts. They all need to be secured. Um, so it's... Again, it's, it's kind of complicated. But the idea is we bring this, this administrative proxy between all those administrative folks and the Active Directory um, environment. That gives us a couple of advantages. Um, first, 
because we bring that proxy in there, we're able to put a layer of intelligence between, uh, forget about Red Forest for a second, we are able to put a level of intelligence between the, the operations that they're doing and the Active Directory. So we can come in and we can, we can do some checking, some access checking before we do that. We can be really granular in the way we look at permissions and, and how we go through that kind of environment. Um, but from a Red Forest design, it means that they're not really using their own credentials. We have a, a service account, the proxy account, that's doing the actual permissions or doing the actual operations. Um, and so those credentials that we were concerned about, people logging in with and getting stolen and, and being able to go there, can't really do anything in the domain unless they go through our proxy. Um, the, the, the single point, the, if I, can I do a, uh, no, I can't, never mind. Um, the, the single point of kind of environment is that, that little link there between the, the, the data sources, and that's a hardened service account that exists in one place. Um, so it's a much more secure environment just from that perspective because you don't have this proliferation of, uh, of, uh, of administrative credentials as they're going through the network. Questions, thoughts on that? Okay. The, 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 the good question. So the question is, and I'll, the question is what prevents someone from bypassing the proxy? Um, very simply, they just don't have permissions. So instead of, instead of having a domain administrator account, you have a logical domain administrator account that, where, the, the, where the, the actual privilege exists within the proxy. So they're using a low privileged account to connect to the proxy, and then the proxy uses the real domain administrator account to go and do the work. Um, so they can't go around it because they wouldn't have, any, they wouldn't have the ability to do it. Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the so the the point was so the uh, we have really kind of one domain administrator account, and then everybody else has lower privileged accounts that allow them to allow them to connect in. Um, I'll hesitate to say one. I'll certainly agree with fewer. I'll certainly agree with fewer. Yeah, and the whole idea here is, you know, let's let's restrict the number of kind of accounts that we have to be concerned about out there. Good question. I think that goes to the next bullet, which is how do we handle enterprise administrators and things like that who are going to make changes to the schema? Yeah, certainly we're we're going to have some situations where um, not so we we've reduced the number of people who are who are accessing the Active Directory. Uh, or who are in a privileged account, um, but we're still going to have some people who have to engage and use privileged accounts. So how do we handle that? Um, so now we get to kind of the better component of things, which is we're going to add a, a, a privileged access management or a privileged session management um, kind of scenario. So there's two kind of components that I want to talk about here. And again, I, try, I was trying to keep it sort of uh, platform agnostic um, versus kind of talking too much, but. Um, kind of there's two basic scenarios we have here. One would be a kind of a privileged password management. Um, the idea here is we have a set of credentials that get checked into a password safe. Um, that password safe, uh, the, used to the point that Joe made earlier, the end user doesn't know what those credentials are. Um, if they need to get them, they can go and request a release. It can go through an approval workflow. Um, we go and, and, uh, and, and give them access to it. Um, we can do the same thing kind of with service accounts and, and those kinds of things. So we can remove embedded passwords and replace them with kind of a check-in, check-out kind of policy. And the reason this is important is, the, and the key thing here is, is that we have automatic password changes. So when the, end, when the user or when the, when the administrator is done with that set of credentials, at the end of that process, we change the password. Um, and the advantage here is, even if then the user is able to pass, dump the hash, get access to those credentials and try to do a replay attack on those credentials, the hashes are different now because we've changed the password. So it provides much more resiliency from an administrative perspective. So even if you get something and you can steal it, it's worthless by the time you can do it. And then we also get the full kind of, uh, the full kind of audit trail. Oh, and by the way, uh, a key ingredient in this whole thing from the, from the Red Forest design is this idea of a bastion host um, and, and, a, and a secure workstation that you can then use to administer the domain. Um, and, and so we provide that kind of as just part of parcel out of the box around this idea of session management. So Joe touched on this earlier where, uh, you know, you, you go and you click and you get a session window and it comes up and you've never seen the username and password, you've not, never even done the authentication, um, but you're in a privileged session. 
Um, that privilege session is running from a hardened appliance that isn't being connected to for any other purpose. And so we get, again, no work on your part, no need to provide a secondary uh, administrative workstation. You've just got, you've, you've got this hardened Bastion host kind of ready to go. Um, and again, as Joe touched on, we can, we can lock it down. We can only allow specific commands. We can, we can kind of uh, lock some of that stuff down. And again, the password never left the secure Bastion host. Um, so, and we've, we've never authenticated anywhere but the server we were administering. Um, so there's no proliferation of credentials, none of that kind of thing. And once we terminate the session, again, the password's going to get changed anyway. So even if somehow those credentials did get stolen, they're now worthless. See, I'm doing time-wise. Okay. I'm going to th throw in one more, uh, and then I think we'll be opening it up for questions. So I think I'm perfect on time. So I'm going to throw this out, and I'm going to throw this out as a, as a, as a best option. Um, I don't know, I think this might be a little bit of overkill, but this is what I would call just-in-time administration. Um, and so this takes the, the, the benefits of the first two and overlays it with an identity and access governance solution. Um, so the scenario here is, is similar to the first kind of scenario, but it shows the interaction between the, the privilege session management, privileged account management system, and an identity management system. And in this scenario, when a user comes in, they request access to a privilege session, they come in, we put it through an approval workflow, and when that, once that situation gets approved, very similar to before, they're going to get access now to a privileged set of credentials. The difference and the key thing that we're integrating here is um, that account doesn't ever actually have any credentials until it's just, any privileges rather, until it's just in time to be uh, to required uh, to, to be checking in the password. So I make it easy. I check out the, that's not a good example, I check out the administrator account. The administrator account has no privileges. It's not in any groups. It's not in domain admin, it's not an enterprise admin, it's not in schema admin, whatever. Um, just in time, just before I release it to the administrator, I go through and I automate that process via my identity management system. So I build up the privileges that that user needs access to. So now I've got this highly privileged account. Um, I release it to the end user. The password of the session gets checked out for the use. When that administrator finishes their task, and again, that could be on a time or you might check it back in, um, we first thing we do is reset the password. Um, and then we, again, use our identity, and access governance, uh, our identity and access governance solution to start tearing down the rights. So we start, we start stripping off the accounts and we bring it back down. And so now, even if they get the password, even if they are able to crack the credentials, that account can't really do anything because it's just an empty account. And so it provides yet another layer of functionality in there. Um, I would argue this is overkill. I think that I think that the uh, I think that, that, that the first two kind of solutions kind of get you a sufficient uh, set of the way there. And to kind of echo what I talked about earlier in, in working with the business, I think that this provides a while it provides an additional layer of security, um, it probably provides an additional layer of complexity. Um, that's probably unnecessary. But we have had customers who've come and said, hey, we, this is the kind of functionality we need, um, and we have the ability to provide kind of that functionality. So I would argue that this myth is busted as well. You don't need a red forest, and there are other solutions that are in there. So those are my slides. It looks like I have about uh, five minutes. So if there are any questions or comments or thoughts, I'd be happy to take them. If not, I can give you five minutes back in your... Uh, in your agenda. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, next session is going to be Get IAM Right, featuring George and Joe together, one night only. So, it'll be good.